Hello and welcome to another episode of the Laura Sanzo podcast with your host, Laura Sanzo. Everyone's perception of the world is different based on their model of the world, and her goal is to celebrate that by building the most inclusive self development podcast. Laura and her guests share their stories and share invaluable strategies from the world of science, spirituality, business, health, personal relationships, and everything in between. We cover it all. Get inspired, learn to welcome adversity, understand the failures only feedback, and get ready to hear discussion on some of the most important issues facing us today. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Laura Santo Podcast. I'm so excited to be here today, joined by Christine Handy. Today, we are looking at the world through the eyes of Christine, who is a mother of two, a breast cancer survivor, thriver, 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 thriver both. Perfect. International speaker, accomplished a model, which we're going to dive into. And can't wait to hear all about New York Fashion Week, bestselling author, and a nationally recognized humanitarian. Welcome so much, Christine. We are so excited to have you here today. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. I'm always inspired by hearing other people's stories. So I hope I can do that for somebody else. And actually that just perfectly preludes into the episode. So we've spoken a lot. So I know some of your stories. So we'll just get all the listeners up to speed. So I like to talk about women's rise story, which I feel that, you know, we all overcome seasons or circumstances or such, whatever they are, that either we could do two, one of two things. We can either allow it to, to allow us to regress from it or to move forward and really be the catalyst of who we were meant to be. Anyway. And yes, mm-hmm. and I call this a woman's rise story. Um, so tell us a little bit about your rise story. I could go on forever. Um, and I love to talk about this because I love to talk about what I did wrong. Mm. And I think it's so critical when you are hearing or trying to be learning from other people's journeys that people are authentic to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what I mean by that is so often, especially these days with social media, the Mm. highlight reels are what we look at or we look to, and those aren't, those aren't authentic. So it's easy for us to paint a picture of perfection and to have filters and to show that to the world and look what great vacation I'm going on. And, and don't get me wrong, I do that as well. But I also like to talk about the muddy stuff because mm. it's an inaccurate picture and it's not fair because it basically, it divides people's self-esteem because they might compare their own life to that, to the highlight reel. So going back to my story, I lived a life of comparing myself to highlight reels for a very long time. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had two other major illnesses where I really looked at my life and my external beauty, which is what I was dependent on for so long by being in the modeling space. I looked at that external beauty for so many years as my only measure. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't getting campaigns from the biggest um, modeling jobs, then, then my value was nothing. I felt like I was not worthy of love or attention or to make money because I, because if something was wrong externally, right. If I had a scar, if my hair wasn't colored perfectly, or if the, the cut wasn't right, or if I wasn't the the perfect weight, then I was measured by that. And I allowed that. And so when I was stripped away of my external beauty, right. With breast cancer and chemotherapy and months and months of being ill, I had to really look inside and go, okay, where is my worth coming from? And it wasn't until I changed my measure. Society didn't change my measure, right? We can, we can feel like society gives us our worth, right? Or we can feel like we give our own worth to ourselves. And until my measure changed, I was stuck in this kind of loneliness of I'm not good enough. This like, this ruminating on, I can never be enough and always comparing myself to other people. But the truth is people will always be more, more beautiful. People will always be more, have more money. People always have more success. It doesn't matter. It's your measure. It's your measure. And so when I decided to change my measure, that's when my life became different. I started to serve. I started to focus Mm. intentionally on serving and that was my measure. And so if I could serve other women, if I could teach women how not to do it, 
because I was never very, I, I, the things, the materialism and the, and the accolades and the modeling jobs that I got that I thought could sustain my self-esteem were only cutting it down because the yeah. bag never kept me warm at night. The bag, you know, the bag yeah. that I opened was now, was now used. And that's why there's so many people that have to get the money or get the relationship or get something outside of themselves. And they're still not happy. It's like, it's universal. I wasn't mm-hmm. the only one that felt that way, yeah. but I was so stuck in it that I couldn't get out. And it wasn't until a doctor said to me, this is your percentile chance of survival and diagnosed at 41 years old of breast cancer, where I was like, whoa, this is it. Yeah. Like, this is, this is as good as it gets. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, and in, in what you brought up in the intro, I didn't want to survive. I wanted to thrive. I didn't want to show people how to survive. I wanted to show people how to live a life of thriving and they're very different. And so after my cancer diagnosis, I wrote a book. I became a best-selling author. I became a motivational speaker. I became a mentor to breast cancer patients. I started speaking in prisons. And all of those things that are they're, they're not accolades in my opinion. They're just things that I chose to do to thrive and to show people what thriving looks like. But if I measured my weight or measured my success or measured my worthiness, if the book became a bestseller, if the book mm. was becoming a film, if all these ifs, then I still wouldn't be happy. But I didn't care what the outcome was anymore. I didn't care if it, I mean, of course, everybody wants their book to be popular because they wanted yeah. to help. Well, in my opinion, I wanted to help people, but it was always my measure, right? If we can figure out what your measure is, then you'll know whether you're going to live a, a life of fulfillment. And, you know, I'm sure men do this as well, but because we communicate predominantly with women, don't you find, and, you know, myself included, and just, you know, we just always look for something outside of, or we attach our worth or self-love or whatever it is to something outside of us. Um, and it's, it's really unfortunate because we really are enough. We are. And here's, here's an exercise that you can do. And I did not do this for years and years and years. I had this tape in my head that said, I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable. I'm not enough. And when I started to say I'm worthy and mm-hmm. self-affirmations, anything you say after I am, you become. So when I said I am not worthy, I didn't, I wasn't worthy because I wasn't worthy for myself. And so when I started to have I am state, I am statements that were positive, right. that had a positive impact on my life. But what I'm saying is it doesn't take one time. If you wake up tomorrow morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am worthy, it's not like you're all of a sudden going to th- think I'm worthy. Yeah, It takes months. And 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 the practice, it's called self-care. And we hear that word a lot in our communities. It's true. We have to work on our self-esteem constantly or it will get sliced in the communities that we live in because that's human nature, right? Comparison and competition. And, and I always try to tell people, you know, comparison is out. Collaboration is it, but you have to, <laughs> but you have to focus on that. You have to live a life of that. And I think it stems also from a lack mindset in the sense of, you yeah. know, if your book is a bestseller, that means that there's not enough for my book to be a bestseller. And that really is just not the way that it works. It's there really is enough for, for all of us. So you were modeling prior to your diagnosis. Yes. So, and you're still modeling. So tell us a little bit about how that has changed for the yes. positive in terms well, of, go ahead. Yeah. No, please. Just in terms of how it's changed um, in terms of. Oh, no, it's totally changed. Yeah, it's totally changed. So from your perspective and also from the perspective of how, how you're being received, because you've totally changed I'm any changing. ideology around yes. body image. I think the whole industry in general is changing at a very slow rate because it is 2023 and we're now starting to just see plus size models more rapidly. Um, you know, right. so I think the whole industry is slowly changing as a right. whole and you are obviously a catalyst for that change as well. So just how has that change been on both sides from your perspective and from the industry's perspective? Right. Well, when I was 23 and living in the modeling agency for elite in Barcelona, thinking that I was worthless <laughs> <laughs> working at 50 uh, New York fashion week or Miami swim week in a bathing suit with 18 year olds. And you were um, 23. I no versus when I was 23, when, oh, okay. I'm 20, when I was 23 and living yes. in you know, one of the, who wouldn't want to live in the modeling agency yeah. in elite for elite in Barcelona? Like you, you, it's great. Right. <laughs> 
I was miserable. I was literally miserable. And I, and I was so insecure to now when I started walking in New York fashion week in, at 50 and Miami swim week with the 18 year olds, with the 19 year olds, I remember that. Right. I remember yeah. doing that. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm happy now I'm li- I'm, I'm, this is different because I'm doing it for a different reason. My yeah. focus is different. It's not for the accolades. It's not for the self-indulgent, right? It's for, to help other women who don't have a chest. I don't have a chest. I have a concave chest. And I decided to go back to modeling after breast cancer, not right after breast cancer. I was kind of done with my career. I thought that career, because I wrote a book and I was focused on writing and I went back to get my master's degree at Harvard. And I wanted to really focus on those things. And, and then all of a sudden I lost, I had a MRSA infection in my implant when in 2020, when the whole world was shut down with COVID and ultimately my, my chest was excavated from the implants without any chance of reconstruction because a MRSA infection had eaten skin and it was a terrible situation. And so all of a sudden I went from breast cancer eight years before that and implants to having implants for eight years and really loving them to having no chest at all. Mm. And I had to really digest that because even after I had breast cancer, I woke up from the mastectomy with something on my chest. I never had seen my chest without anything. And so to go eight years after that and to be, have a chest excavated, it was super confusing and emotionally very difficult. And physically the, the pain was grotesque, but once I digested all of that, because I knew that I could use my breast cancer story for purpose, then I knew I could use my MRSA infection for purpose. So I called my mm-hmm. modeling agency in 2020. And I said, after I you know, had healed physically, I said, I want to come into the agency and I want to show you, you know, my, what my body looks like now, but I want to come back to work and I want to do runway. And they were like, we well, don't <laughs> ever do runway. Why would you want to do runway? And I said, well, there's a reason I want to show you. So when I went back into the modeling agency, they weren't really supportive and I wasn't mad at them. I didn't say to them like, well, I can't believe you're not supporting me with this. They just weren't sure that that would be well-received. Right. And so I decided that I would take it upon myself and I flew up to New York city. I'd never been to fashion week in my life. I flew up to New York city in 2021, the first time they opened after COVID and I would find my way at shows in the back of the line because I didn't have a ticket and I would gently say to them, can, if, if somebody doesn't show up, can I have a seat? And they would let me in, you know, if they had a seat, five of those designers that I went up to. And I said, I'd like to walk in New York fashion week. My name is Christine Handy. I I have a concave chest. I want to help people who have, are having a difficult time with their loss and their, you know, digesting that. And I had five designers that said, yes. Now I don't think they knew at the time that I'd never walked runway. I'd always been a print model. But I knew I trusted myself. I knew that I would watch YouTube videos. I knew I could figure out how to walk. And so I ended up doing a great job and I've now walked in four different seasons. But it was because I took the pain that I had gone through and I took the the emotional duress and said, if I feel this bad, then I know there's other women that feel this bad. How can I lighten their load? How can I lighten the the impact that that I had to go through? And, and the, the best way that I knew how to do that was to get on a bigger stage, right? Mm-hmm. Well, there's not much bigger stage than New York Fas- Fashion Week. Right. And so I was like, I had the courage to do it. I had, I had, I knew that if I tried that I, even if they said no, I knew I would feel good about trying. And so when people started to say yes, I was like, okay, now we're going to have an impact. So pre, so this past New York Fashion Week, which was two weeks ago. Yeah. How was that? I've been dying to ask, but I wanted to wait till we were recording. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. I, one of the, well, I did four shows and one of the shows was a designer from Germany and he brought most of his models from Germany. And what was really beautiful about that show was a lot of those people knew each other. And typically when you work in a show in New York fashion week or Miami swim week or LA fashion week, regardless of all of them are about the same, you just, everybody's new to each other. Right. And it was really nice to walk for him because he had this built-in community. And so people were like cheering each other on. They were helping each other. They had brought a choreographer from from Frankfurt to choreographer to be the choreographer for the show. And he wanted everybody to walk a little bit differently. And he wanted to, people to do these certain poses. And so we had this kind of community feel there. And 
it just happened to be that on that day, WGN TV in Chicago was interviewing me from the runway right before we, you know, before the runway show. So they were so supportive of me and, you know, being interviewed, being on live TV. And so it just was a really good experience, but the impact has been prof so profound. And so anything I post, people repost and they want to share it to the breast cancer community and to the community of people who feel less than or feel less worthy. They're, they're saying, look what she's doing. If she can do this, we can do this. And so I think that one of my missions is to, to say to people, you can borrow my courage. Yeah, and that's why. Is it in those moments, because, you know, when something like this happens to somebody, they can easily have gone the other way in the sense of had that victim mentality and, you know, the why me and not really see anything past that. So in those moments, like the one you just had in New York Fashion Week, and I know your your model is all, there's always purpose and pain, um, but just if you're willing to the story, to share the story, sorry. But in those moments, do you have one of, like those kind of thoughts then in the sense of now I understand why everything played out the way? that it played out in the sense of in the capacity that you're meant to serve and the story that you're meant to share? Yeah. You know, I thought I had a really big story and I thought it had a really big impact. And, you know, as if breast cancer wasn't enough, as if a fused arm wasn't enough, as if, yeah. a, you know, all of those things were enough. But in a way, I felt like when I lost my chest, it was a whole bigger community that I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I had implants and I still resembled what I look like. And then when that was taken away, I was like, I'm missing a whole huge demographic of people that I need to serve. And if I'm the one that has the bravery to do it or the courage to do it, then give me that. And so, you know, I'm not, I was a victim when I, when my measure was dependent on society, right. Or mm -hmm. my measure depended on my husband or, you know, my, when I thought to myself, well, my husband should be making me happy. If I'm not happy, why is he not making me happy? That's a terrible mentality because my measure shouldn't be another person. Right. It makes me happy. It should be me making me happy or my, you know, my faith and my walk with my personally, my walk with my faith. And so again, going back to my measure, when that changed that my whole life shifted. And so I think I was a victim for a very long time because I wanted, I, I didn't know how to fill myself up. And so, so even be way before the diagnosis. Oh my gosh. Way before the diagnosis. Once mm. I was diagnosed with cancer, things I love were that. terrible. I mean, they were spinning out of control in the beginning, but once I settled into the diagnosis and, yeah. and started to really figure out what life was about, then the, vet, the victim mentality left completely. So, but it, again, you know, and I think it's so true of a lot of trauma. Most people don't go the way I go. Yeah. And so if I can be a light and a beacon of hope for people, because I'm sharing my story in my way, then I think it teaches people a different way to react, you know, because re how we react is how we ultimately survive anything. 100%. So just to just circle back in what we said in the sense of that comparison piece and the whole aspect of find or looking for things outside of ourselves to attach our worth to and such, you know, we live in a time with social media and we're we're at the age that we remember life before social media and it was already hard as a woman in terms of the comparison piece so now it's just social media that heightens the the impact of it where you know we're kind of criticized we have you know a couple of extra pounds or too thin or you know whatever that is so how what would you say to the woman that because our audience is predominantly women so what are you going to say to the woman that's going to listen that is feeling that and how you're able to just be a ray of of light and worthiness and such, even though your body looks different now than it has ever in the, in has it done his, historically, what would yeah. you say to them in the sense of just fully embodying themselves, regardless of our change, our body changes, regardless as we age outside of any circumstances. So just that piece of how they can, they can really embody that piece yeah. of worthiness in a society that's so obsessed with body image. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a long answer and I'll, I'll try to be brief, mm. but it is, it starts with self-talk. Mm. That's first and foremost, what you tell yourself you become. So when I tell myself I have cellulite, I don't have a chest, I have all these scars. I now, I don't have a wrist. I'm, um, you know, cause I'm in the, I'm out in the dating world. And if I say mm. to myself, who is going to love conversation, <laughs> right. But if I say to myself, who's going to love me without a chest? Who's going to love me with all these yeah. scars? Who's going to love me with my history of health issues, right? That's Those are valid. 
But if I say that to myself, then I'm, I'm negating my self-esteem. But if I say to myself, I'm, I'm lovable, I'm yeah. loving, I'm capable of love. I'm capable. I'm worthy. Those are different. Those are different thoughts. And those are different. Those are, that's a different voice. And so first and foremost, I would start with your voice and, and really sit down and say to yourself, what am I telling myself? What voice is coming through? Is it the cheerleading voice or I'm going to cheer for you? I'm going to, you know, we're, we're going to do this together. Or is it the negating voice of, you know, you're not, you're not doing a good job. That's first. Then you have to take yourself and think about what other people are telling you. What, who are you surrounding yourself with? And I'm talking yeah. about really get clear. You know, I had an, an ex that was very critical of me and I was listening to him over my voice mm-hmm. and that my self-esteem was slaughtered. So once you get rid of those types of voices and you change your voice in your own head, then you have to look at what you're listening to as far as like podcasts. Like this is a good example. Listen to a podcast where they give you tools to help, right? Don't, you know, if you're watching violent shows and you feel unsettled after those shows, maybe choose yeah. different shows, P- choose more peaceful shows. It's always the voices, right? First it's us, then it's other people, then it's podcasts, then it's TV, then it's music. What music are you listening to? And once you take that whole equation and and if it, if you are anxious and you're unsettled and you change some of those things over time, I, I promise you, your self-esteem will automatically raise because you're only allowing cheerleaders in your life. You're only, your voice, even though it's going to take a while, when you say you're worthy, you're going to keep saying it until you actually believe it. And so those are some tools that I, even myself do it. And I have a kind of an unstoppable self-esteem at this point. And I, I think, the, <laughs> I think, I think one other piece of that puzzle is who were you trying to impress? If you're trying to impress society or your friends or your mates or your family or your children, fine. But remember that most of those things can be taken away. If I'm, I look into God and I say, okay, God, if I'm good with you, I'm good with everything. That's my measure. That can't be taken away. Nobody can take my faith away from me. Yeah. And so whatever your measure is, you have to be very careful of what that is because a lot of things can be taken away, money, finances, friendships, relationships, right? So try to plant yourself in things that can't be taken away. I used to always say thirties is the best decade for women. And then as I continue to be in my forties, I'm like, hmm, forties enough. It's just, you get the sense of worth and self-acceptance that I don't, I don't, you know, as much as somebody does growth work or such and experiences, I don't know if they could have it in their twenties and thirties. So there really is so much beauty in aging as much as society doesn't want us to age and, you know, but there really is so much beauty in aging. Well, and and the last piece of that puzzle I think is important is what you focus on, you also become. Mm-hmm. So I focus every day and say, okay, I, today I'm going to serve and not just that, but today mm-hmm. I'm going to be grateful. The fact that I am alive and I didn't, cancer didn't take me. And so that's my, that is what I focus on, right? If you focus on things that are, you know, other people, right? If you focus on, well, they have this job or they have this much money or they have that car or they have this, they're going on this trip. And I don't have that. That imposter syndrome. You're, you're kind of be, you might be unhappy. And that's, that's too, that's a, that's a shame because if you've changed your focus, then you can get back into alignment with who you are and you will be more peaceful. 100%. I think it's also, um, you know, knowing that if you can see that for other people, you can see that for yourself as well. So just a little bit of a reframe of being happy for people. I love how you said settle into a diagnosis. I'm sure easier said than done, right? Yes, yes, yes. Definitely easier. Again, a lot of though. Yeah, a lot of those things are focuses of mine. Yeah. I don't want to like stay there too long, but just, you know, what would be a piece of advice that you would give to somebody that may be listening to this and may have had a diagnosis and may be thriving after cancer and such, or even family members, right? We all know, obviously, somebody that has had yeah. cancer or had cancer. What would just be one piece that you would say for that the settling into diagnosis? Because it's so powerful. I've never heard that before in terms of reframing a diagnosis. Um, so one thing that I learned, and I wouldn't say this was immediate, Mm. But one thing, one thing that I learned was to get rid of the outcome. And what I mean by that was when I was first diagnosed, I was so, I was filled with such great fear and fear translates into anger. So I was angry, right? I was angry at the world. I was angry that I had no family history and why me? That's mm. the Especially at that young age. It's, it's horrible. 
But when I started to settle into the diagnosis, it was there. It was, it existed. I was going to be in that space for 15 months at least. I was, I, I had to have 28 rounds of chemo. Wow. So I knew that for 15 months, I was going to be, I was going to feel terrible. And I decided that if I could show bravery for me every day, then maybe I was showing bravery for other people. Maybe I was showing bravery to my children. Maybe I was showing bravery to my community. And if I could just focus on one day, then maybe I could get to the next. Cause there were many days where I wasn't sure I was going to wake up. And so when I got rid of that fear and got rid of the outcome, cause I used to say to myself in the beginning, well, what if I die? What if I don't make it? When I stopped saying that and I just said, okay, well, every day I'm going to show courage. Then the outcome left, like whether I was going to live or die was out of my control. It still is out of my control. People will say to me all the time, how come you're not afraid? It's out of my control. For all of us, it, really. And so it's really, it's really letting go of the outcome. If I do my job every single day, which is to serve and to inspire and to give people hope, when my expiration day is up, I'm good. And that is a living a life of freedom. And so don't get me wrong. Diagnosis is horrible. It's scary. It's debilitating. It's paralyzing. And I felt all of those emotions. And I wasn't constantly in this freedom space. You're going to have to build a house in the illness world. When mm. you're diagnosed with cancer, you're going to have to build a house in the illness world. You've had a house in the well world. Now you have to build a house in the illness world. It's not pretty. You're not going to have the pretty shutters, mm. but eventually you're going to build a different house. And it's going to be somewhere between the well and the illness world, because you can never really go back to the totally well world. Cause you know what it looks like to be not well. Yeah. And that house is where I sit because I still have a ton of doctor's appointments. I still have a, a, some chronic illnesses from the chemo and have heart issues and things like that. So my, my, my house looks different. It doesn't have a white picket fence, but it's my choice as to how to build that new house. And I know that every season doesn't last forever. And so if I'm, if I go back into the illness world, I know that that's going to have a, a beginning, a middle and an end. Right. And so to get yourself out of that huge space of when is this going to end? I don't know what the outcome is. I'm so scared to, I'm going to show courage every day and I'm going to build a house the way I want it to look. It may have, may not have a white picket fence, but I'm going to build it as best I can. That's a different focus. And so that's how I, what I had to do for myself in order to get through it. Can we just take a moment to celebrate you? <laughs> so after, so after so that, sweet. after that course in 2020, you had your surgery and by, yes. cor correct me if I'm wrong. And then by 2021, you were at New York Fashion Week. Correct. Yes. Ready to. Seven months later. Seven yeah. months later. That's amazing. And, and starting a bathing suit line for women without a chest. Yeah, no, I, um, it took me a few months to go back into my closet. I live in Miami. And so I had mm -hmm. to go back into my closet and I, I've always been a bit of a provocative dresser and because I like celebrating my body. Yeah. And so when I, so when my chest was excavated, I went into my closet and I was like, am I going to have to throw all of my clothes away? And it, that was a bummer. And I didn't throw them all away, but I, I had to get rid of a lot of them. And I, and that was a, a mourning process. It mm. took a lot of courage for me to go in my closet at all. I was afraid of my closet because I have bras. I have sports bras. I have really beautiful dresses that I will never wear again, ever. And that's a hard, that's a hard truth. But if I focused on that versus, you know what? I'm going to give this whole group of clothes to the women's shelter in Miami. I'm going to give all of my bras and all of mm. my sports bras to this group of women. If I can... You know, it's like I compartmentalized it and turned the tape around. And then I woke up one morning and was like, oh, I can do, I can do better than that. Mm. I can walk in New York fashion week. And my, and my, again, my modeling agency was like, I don't think so. And I was like, oh, I can, I will oh. figure it out. And I can. So it was steps. It didn't just, it didn't occur to me the day after I woke up with the chest excavated that I was going to walk in New York fashion week. It was steps along the way where I was like, okay, how can I use this to help other people? How can I use that? And it ultimately turned into, and, and by the way, I also did a campaign with 
recently with Victoria's Secret. And I was going to break it up. I wasn't, I didn't know if I could, so I was going to little hint at it, but I'm so glad you brought it up. Thank you. (laughs) So how that happened was I said to my manager about, well, after I'd walked in New York Fashion Week, I said to my manager, we need a bigger audience because think about the impact we can have with a bigger audience. And it's always, it's about, it's always about the impact, right? I'm going to be sharing my story every single day. So we might as well have a bigger audience because we can help more people. So I said, why don't we get in touch with Victoria's Secret? And she was like, well, okay, look, I don't know anybody there, but we'll try. What a great marriage, right? A a person who's modeled for 40 years and the largest lingerie brand in the world. What a great marriage. So it was, I, I thought this is a great idea. So it took us months to get in touch with them. My my manager ultimately bartered to get their contact. She oh, gave wow. she gave something up to get that, right? So she ends up getting in touch with them and they send somebody to watch to watch me in New York Fashion Week. How interesting is that? So had I never done the whole New York Fashion Week thing, maybe this wouldn't have worked out. I don't know. Yeah. So they send somebody to watch me in New York Fashion Week and they go, oh, she's legit. Let's have a meeting with her. So I have a meeting with them and ultimately several meetings later, they hired me to do a a campaign with them. It's like you have an idea, but you, you continue with the idea, right? Yeah. That that inspired action. You execute. And if they say, here's the thing that maybe is the most important part. I wasn't afraid of no, not -hmm. because I was going to keep hounding them. I wasn't, but if they said no, I'd be like, okay, it wasn't the right brand. It wouldn't have hurt my feelings. It wouldn't have hurt my self-esteem. I just, in fact, it would have helped my self-esteem because I knew I tried. And I think people are so afraid of no, that they don't go for it. And they just stop. They get derailed. Why would I ever think that Christine Handy could do a collaboration with Victoria's Secret? It's insane. Right. But that mentality will get me nowhere. Yeah. If I say to myself, what a great marriage between you and Victoria's Secret because you've modeled for 40 years. You have, you know how to do it. You have the story. That's that's a different mentality, right? Yeah. So it's what you tell yourself. And you got that intuitive nudge for a reason. Or else you I wouldn't have nudge. or else you wouldn't have you you wouldn't have thought in it. Simple well, now that. I'm nudging exact. Well, that's I believe that comes from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But now I have a lot of other nudges for to work. <laughs> And so I'm working on those nudges, which I can't talk about, but those nudges are in place as well. Okay. So I know we can talk about Walk Beside Me. So let's make sure we talk about Walk Beside Me. Yeah. So I wrote a book. That was my biggest, I think my biggest jump from after chemo. I I decided I'm going to write a book, which I've never written a book. um, And I was not trained to write a book. The book is good and it's been well received. It's actually being made into a film right now. Yes. Willow. It was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to start being made into a film in May of 2020. Obviously we know what happened then. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a good book. It's, it's served a lot of people because people learn a lot about the illness, but it's also a good tool for people to learn how to take care of others during illness, because my friends were champions for me. They really showed up for me and you really see that in the book. So it's a good tool for people to have. Um, and the movie is going to be very similar to the book, which is great because a lot of films that are adapted from novels look very different. This film is going to look very similar to my book. You do so many different things. You surf in so many different capacities. Everything is on your website. But if we just had to just kind of put everything into like a little short verb, <laughs> what can we just, what can people in terms of the book, in terms of your modeling, your speaking, your humanitarian serve, uh, the way that you serve? in that way, how can people really dial into that? Well, I'm, and I am on most social medias. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to reach out, I do respond to so many things. I, I do do a lot of things. I'm on the board of three nonprofits. I'm obviously a motivational speaker. I'm, I'm still right. I I'm finishing my master's degree at Harvard and I'm working on the film as well, but I don't have a lot of personal time (laughs) because I'm on a mission. I, I the, truth, the truth is, I know how bad life can feel, mm. whether it's with my diagnosis, whether it was with my insecurity, whether it was through my divorce, whether it was through my MRSA infection in my chest, whether it was through the, Im- the implant illness. I know what pain looks like. If I can soften anybody's blow to pain, I'm a yes every single day. And so I'd rather sacrifice my personal time 
to help inspire and lead and, and be a facilitator of hope than anything in this world. Because there are were moments in my journey where I was like, I quit. And those are the worst moments that anybody can ever go through. And if I can make somebody feel like not quitting, then that's what I'm going to do. And so, you know, I, you, you know, look, for, look me up and follow me on social media. I think I'm showing thriving, which I think is a really good message that these days is, is specifically. Of course, we're going to put everything in the show notes. One thing that I've learned from Tony Robbins specifically that changed my life and really got me through a lot of things, including grieving was to turn pain into power. And I think you should just have, you should be like poster child <laughs> for how to turn pain into power and purpose, essentially. Well, I think if people look at my pictures from when I was going through chemo and they look at me now and they look at me on New York Fashion Week and Miami Swim Week, and I think people are, they, I think the picture shows a very good, pic accurate picture. Because when you see the pictures of me going through chemo, you realize that it looks like I, I wasn't going to wake up many nights. And to, to go from that to what I'm doing now, it really is a miracle. And, and I'm so grateful for the courage. I'm so grateful for the, the nudges because, and I'm so grateful for the people that have cheered me on, mm -hmm. you know, even social media, when people cheer me on, it gives me more courage. Yeah. If I didn't have that, then maybe I would have not done as much as I could to help people. But it really does help. So reach out to me. I want to hear. <laughs> and on that note, I also want to just acknowledge the fact that, you know, you have this incredible platform, you do amazing work, you have a huge social media presence, and you have to be one of the most personable people I've ever met. I'm going to, so anybody that's going to reach out to you, just, I want them to know how Thank you. personable you are and how authentic you are and how you're showing up right now is how you really are. Not that I know you well, but just in terms of our of our energy exchanges up to now. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody really knew that. Yeah. I know you can talk about everything, but is there anything you can share in the sense of what we can expect? We're so early in the year, like there's so much year left. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing this year will be the film. You know, we're supposed to start filming in the summer and we're going to film in Europe, um, well, overseas. And the reason that they've decided to do that is because they want to bring the film in as a foreign film. It mm. it, uh, it it can have a very good, it can have a, a different trajectory of going toe to toe with other films for an Oscar per se. Nice. And we, and we hope that that actually, I truly believe it will happen. It's a, it's a, first of all, breast cancer is on the rise, unfortunately. And there needs to be a movie about a survivor <laughs> So often we look at Hollywood films and we see like Philadelphia or Steel Magnolias or all these films where yeah. the protagonist dies. Yeah. And about the well, unhealthy world, the unwell world who dies. And yeah. this is a story of hope. This is a story of a survivor. And so we need to have that. You know, there needs to be a movie about that. And I'm grateful that it's going to be mine. But I think people, I think that will be really, really well received in the world. 100%. I think even outside of, of the specifics just the essence of hope and light and love and and that piece of it is a dose that we all need well People don't get me wrong the film is also very sad i mean the course. book is very sad the book is very sad but it's it's the ending is is hopeful it's not perfect the the protagonist doesn't walk off into the sunset with the perfect relationship and the perfect life you know that doesn't exist i live in chronic pain yeah. I've had major relationship issues. It's it's not the perfect story, but it's real life and it's hope. Which I think people need to see because just to circle back what, what you said in the beginning, the sense of everyone sees everyone's highlight wheels. Exactly. So yes. people people need to, to see that. Is there anything that we may not have touched on that just uh, we're talking about those nudges that intuitively you're being shared to call as we come to a close? Well, I think that, I think one of the biggest messages that I can talk about is that I felt for 40 years that I had no voice. Mm. And the truth is, the truth is we really do. But until we believe in ourselves, we won't try. And so now it looks like I have an amplified voice, right? If you look me up, there's a lot of information about it. But I went from have, feeling like I had no voice to an amplified voice. You can do the same thing. We all have a voice. We all have the opportunity to use our painful stories into yeah. messages to help other people. Every single one of us does. It's just a matter of focus and a matter of saying yes to it. 
And so I would encourage everybody to realize that their self-worth and their self-esteem is something that needs to be worked on every day. It's like a muscle. It's like going to the gym. It's that critical. You will make better decisions about your life with a strong self-esteem. It has to start there. I love that unstoppable self-esteem. I love what you just said, because especially as women, I think there's so many women that are still not sharing their story, using their voice, didn't mean their light. Um, so I thank you for that. Cause I think it's, it's so powerful. And I think we also underestimate what we can do as one person. I think we think sometimes yeah. we're one person, what can we possibly do? And there's so much power of just showing up and sharing. And there's so much power in cheering other people on. Yes. Yes. You, there is no competition. There is plenty. There is more than plenty to go around. Yeah. You're not competing with anybody. Yes. There is so much more to ground and thank you so much for your light. We look forward to everything that's going to be coming out of, of your space. And thank you so much. This is such a joy. Yay. Thank you. No, thank you for putting me on your platform and, and elevating my voice to help other people. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Truly. We hope you've enjoyed that episode of the Laura Sanso podcast. Thank you to our guests. To stay connected to host Laura Sanso, follow her at I am Laura Sanso or at the Laura Sanso podcast on Instagram. To learn more about Laura, go to www.laurasanso.com.